I will give now the floor to Mr. Silesh Krishnarao uh, from Climate Healers. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Eleonora, for this opportunity. I want to talk to you about ethics. And I show here a picture of a little baby girl. I shudder to think what would have happened to her if she had come to Europe 100 years ago. She, to me, is a symbol of the tremendous ethical and moral progress that humanity has made just in the last two centuries. Because she's half South Asian Indian, she's one quarter African American, and she's one quarter Native American. So 100 years ago, she probably would have come here in a zoo as an exhibit. And today, she's a welcome guest at the European Union Parliament, and she's our granddaughter. She's a symbol of the tremendous ethical and moral progress that we have made as humanity, and we should be proud of that. And there is also a continuing ethical and moral progression in this, the raising of human consciousness that has been happening, and that it continues to happen today. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about that in the context of UN conventions that we have been working towards. I'm an optimist. My name is Silesh Rao, and I'm a salesman of ahimsa. I'm a salesman of nonviolence and veganism, which is the modern interpretation of nonviolence, even though ahimsa is a very old concept from the Vedas. So how do we connect that with the conventions that the UN is working towards? You know, in the UN, there were three main conventions that came out of Rio. The first was the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it aimed to conserve biological diversity on the planet and to ensure the sustainable use of its genetic resources. And one of the first goals was that we were going to eliminate biodiversity loss by the year 2010. It hasn't happened. The second convention was the Convention to Combat Desertification, and its aim is to reverse and prevent desertification and land degradation. Last year, we lost 30 million acres of land to deserts, so it hasn't happened yet. The third convention was the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and its aim is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. And ever since this was signed, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere have been increasing, not decreasing. It's been increasing at a faster rate than ever before, so it hasn't happened. So there is a lot that people at the top have been trying to do, but they have been unable to do. Because the evolution has to happen from the bottom up. And it is happening from the bottom up. So to set this in context, I want to ask you three questions. The first question is, would you agree that if consumers change their preferences, producers have no option but to meet those change preferences? Yes or no? Yes. For the second question, I want to set a stage. Imagine a weightlifter who is 150 kgs, and he's lifting 500 kgs over his head, and he discovers that he's standing in quicksand and he's sinking. What is the first thing that the weightlifter should do? Would you agree that it is prudent for him to drop the weight as opposed to keeping it on or doubling it to 1,000 kgs? Yes? The third question is, would you agree that it is inhumane to deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? Yes. So it's unanimous, you see. We have answered the three questions in the way I expected you to, because that's who you are as human beings. We are fundamentally compassionate beings. So let me address the third question first. In the Laudato Si, Pope Francis said, it is contrary to human dignity to cause animals to suffer or die needlessly. And the American Dietetic Association has basically said that it is unnecessary to eat animal foods of any kind at any stage of our life cycle. So in essence, the Pope is asking us all to go vegan, even though he didn't say it that way. He is asking us all to go vegan because it doesn't make any sense for us to eat animal foods unnecessarily. And the UN Environment Program's International Panel on Sustainable Resource Management has said that a global shift towards a vegan diet is vital to save the world from hunger, fuel poverty, and the worst impacts of climate change. So the UN also agrees that we are going to get there. It is inevitable we are going to get there. The question is how fast do we get there and who leads it? Who comes along as a follower? And who joins kicking and screaming at the end? That's the only choice we have. It is inevitable this is going to happen. If you look at the biomass distribution of megafauna, and this is the second question I asked you about the weightlifter, right? 10,000 to 100,000 years ago, 
Most of the biomass was wild animals. Megafauna are animals that are 25 kgs or greater in weight. So most of the megafauna was wild animals, and human beings were such a small part, they're less than 1%. Today, it's reversed. There are more human beings than wild animals. So one single species is dominating. Okay? Wild animals are reduced by 80%. Even this by itself would be alarming for an ecologist. In fact, Professor E.O. Wilson has said that this needs to be reversed. Humans should be the smaller circle, and the wild animals should be the bigger circle. Okay? But it doesn't stop here. This is just the beginning. To that, we added another circle of human beings. So that's 400 million metric tons. And on top of that, we are carrying 1,100 million metric tons of livestock unnecessarily. So as a weightlifter who is carrying all this unnecessary weight, the first thing we need to do is to drop the weight. We all agreed on that. If you look at the UN IPCC, in the carbon cycle, we only hear about the fossil fuels and deforestation. Those are those two small numbers there. It's seven gigatons and 1.5 gigatons. But you see, all the red arrows there are human cost contributions. So there is another arrow here, which is 11 gigatons, which is greater than what the fossil fuel contribution are. And that comes from breathing and from changes to land that we have done. And that's where the livestock contribution is sitting. It's being ignored, even though it is there in plain sight for us to see. If you look at the block diagram of land use on the planet, you will notice that 35% of the land area of the planet is being used just for grazing. 10% is used for cropland, about another 20% is used as forests, and what is left for wild animals is less than 9% of the land area of the planet. If you look at the biomass flows, this is all straight from the IPCC, meaning all this data is there for us to see. More than half the dry ton biomass from cropland is going to feed livestock. Only one quarter is going straight as food for human systems. And then we get another 3.8 gigatons of carbon of biomass from grasslands to livestock production. So totally that is 7.01 gigatons of dry matter biomass going to feed livestock. And what do we get out of that? We get 0.26 gigatons. So the conversion efficiency is less than 4% for the livestock system. And that's what really goes into our food system. And there is other things going on there, you know, which you can take a look at. And if you look at the waste, there is two gigatons of waste from the livestock system. And all the waste is collected and fed back to these cropland fallows. So when you take biomass out of land, you're also taking nutrients out of land. And if you don't feed the nutrients back to the land, you're obviously going to desertify the land. So you can see why desertification is happening, just from looking at our land use block diagram, because it's tremendously inefficient. Instead, if you eliminated the livestock system completely, you can take the biomass from crop lands and feed it straight to the human food system, so you don't go through this intermediate animal, and you'll free up 35% of the land area of the planet to be reforested. So we ask the question, when we reforest that land, how much carbon gets sequestered? And the answer turns out to be at least 265 gigatons of carbon, which is greater than the 240 gigatons of carbon that we've added to the atmosphere since the industrial era began. So with that one simple change, we're able to solve all the three UN Convention problems simultaneously. So we are sequestering more carbon than we have added to the atmosphere. We are dealing with biodiversity because we are bringing back the forests. And we can feed our waste back to the forest and to the cropland so that we can close the desertification loop. With that one simple change, we're able to do everything. And that change is happening from the ground up. If you want to know how fast the forest will come back, here is an example from 2002 to 2006. All we had to do was to take livestock out, and the forest came back within four years. And in our simulations, we are seeing that within 20 years, at least 80% of that sequestration will happen. So the solution to our crises is actually very simple. I cycle it back to what my granddaughter told me. She took me to this movie, Cinderella. And in Cinderella, there were three principles that were enunciated by the lead character. The first thing she said was, have courage, be kind, and all will be well. Be kind to all life, and all will be well. It's as simple as that. The second thing she said was, just because it is what is done, doesn't mean it's what should be done. Just because we have been eating meat all along, doesn't mean we should continue to eat meat today because the circumstances have changed. And the third thing she said was, imagine the world as it should be, 
not the world as it is. The world as it should be is a world where half of the earth is covered with forests for biodiversity, for wild animals. And this is exactly what Professor E.O. Wilson said is sustainable. So I imagine the world where half the earth looks like this. And this also is a coffee plantation that became a forest within 20 years. So I see this evolution in ethics and morals that's happening today as an inevitable evolution, and it's equivalent to the caterpillar turning to the butterfly. You see, the caterpillar has no choice but to become a butterfly. So we have no choice but to evolve to our next level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Rao.